Hello, Guru Nation. Welcome back to another episode of the Clinical Trials Guru. True fans of the show will recognize this person because probably three years ago, I want to say three, two or three years ago, we went out, uh, Chris and myself, with DSCS to uh, New York for some business. We met with Michelle at Mount Sinai. She's the administrative director clinical trials office department of medicine at mount sinai health system michelle cohen welcome to the show we've got a lot to discuss a lot has changed not only since our last interview the entire world has changed since our last interview but just since march you know a lot has changed with the pandemic and you were right in the middle you're right there in manhattan in the middle of everything uh now i'm in california we're kind of getting a taste of what's happened uh in new york you know, back in March and April. But uh, welcome back to the podcast, Michelle. Thank you for coming on. Thank you for having me. It's nice to be back. And it's nice that, uh, you know, we're kind of seeing the light at the end of the tunnel with the vaccination right on the horizon. That's right. That's right. Has anyone from uh, Mount Sinai gotten the vaccine yet? Yes, we started vaccinating our uh, emergency room physicians and staff oh, wow. and the ICU. They made a prioritization, which was great, um, you know, that it was not based on position, but based on the location of where you worked mm -hmm. in terms of exposure. So that's, you know, equity in terms of uh, vaccine distribution. That's awesome. And I remember in uh, March or April mm -hmm. when this pandemic was still new, you know, we were messaging each other and I was asking you how things are over there. You said it's absolutely crazy uh, when things settle down a little. We'll do an interview. It's now December, end of December. <laughs> so things have settled down. I mean, the industry is busy, but things have settled down enough to where we can have a podcast, uh, you know, a quick 20-minute podcast. So what's it been like, Michelle, like since March? I mean, you know, you were doing, just to give people context, you were running a unit there doing clinical research studies uh, general medicine, a lot of GI, right? GI, things like that. Yes. So we had nine divisions that we typically dealt with. Um, we, you know, we serve as kind of a, a service provider for our faculty for the Department of Medicine. And in a typical year, we start anywhere between 50 and 60 new clinical trials in, you know, the various divisions, a lot of NASH, a lot of GI Crohn's, um, you see studies, uh, pulmonary division, uh, you know, various divisions. And, you know, in March, when this all broke out, I was approached by the chief of infectious diseases, uh, who normally has her own HIV unit, but she knew she needed more help. And she kind of reached out to me and asked if we could kind of join forces and create a clinical trials office for COVID related processes. And I kind of, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So you guys knew in together. March. I mean, the studies we had. So you knew in March, the studies were going to start cut, like rolling in. So let's set up this uh, department, you know, and then collaborate on it just for COVID. Well, in March, by she and I work on the same floor. So by okay. March uh, 3rd or 4th, um, we knew we already had patients in the hospital and we started she asked if I had expertise in doing emergency INDs and I told her I did. So I became the person at the institution um, completing that alongside with the physicians for our, all the patients. Wow. And then in parallel, we also started um, uh, clinical trials with Regeneron and Gilead and Kinevan and all three of those protocols kind of rolled out in the most rapid process ever. Wow. So you, you guys are working on the COVID treatment stuff. Did you do any vaccine studies? Yes. So what happened was, is that we ran about, I did about 10 clinical trials from March until May. And then what institutionally they decided that they needed to kind of open up its own COVID clinical research area. So they opened that up. And I was asked to help start the Pfizer vaccine study for that group and then hand it off to them when they were ready. Oh, so. wow. Okay. Okay. So where I visited you in that location, is, is this where you're doing that stuff also? Same place? 
Everything happened there at, that's the main hospital. We had studies though in Brooklyn and Queens at Mount Sinai Beth Israel, at West, at Morningside. So I put together a network of about 150 clinical research professionals across the health system and wow. more, you know, kind of grew everybody together and was able to conduct these studies at multiple <laughs> centers, which was amazing and great. So what happened to all the non-COVID studies? Did they just stop or what are, are you still running those? All of our studies didn't stop, but we needed to pivot. Um, and we uh, quickly implemented protocols for telemedicine and for patients to have labs drawn in local centers. And then we dis dispense medication uh, through courier services. And that was, you know, that was basically until July where we were in a place to kind of bring patients back. And then all of our studies that were open to enrollment, we obviously didn't put any new patients in. So that did pause. Wow. Yeah, I, I um, one of the sites I go to is UC San Francisco for their oncology department. And they stopped letting monitors as of March, mid-March, no more monitoring visits even now. Uh, but their coordinators don't even go to the uh, clinic. It's just the, the clinicians see the patients in the clinic and then the coordinators somehow manage everything remotely. Uh, is that a similar setup that you guys are doing or are your coordinators going in seeing patients and things like that? No, our coordinators are in the office seeing patients. I did put my regulatory team uh, remote fully and my finance team remote fully. Okay. Um, at this point, I have regulatory that's back in a hybrid model and my coordinators are also hybrid. It depends on the patient's schedule. So if there's patients that are on site, otherwise we're trying to limit exposure and keep people as safe as we can at home. Yeah. So what, what was it like in March, April, May? I mean, I think things started, uh, coming down a little around the summer and now they're picking back up. But what was it like back then? Like when nobody really understood this virus and uh, I mean, was it like panic over there or were you guys just flooded with so many new patients that uh, you didn't have time to really think? There wasn't a lot of time to process. I mean, we were putting in 10 to 15 new patients just at the main hospital alone for you know, on a given day, yeah. um, you know, some of the biggest decisions we had to was, can we run this study over the weekend? So we're not delaying treatment for these patients. Um, and, you know, we didn't really understand the disease process and the disease progression to understand, you know, who was getting what. So it literally, we were in the pit at the same time with the physicians trying to make the best treatment options available for these patients and, and delineating with the primary care teams as to like the options for the clinical trials. And one of my clinical trial uh, physicians said to me, throw me all the protocols you have. It was a GI specialist who was on the COVID floors. He goes, I want to see everything. This is the best learning opportunity for the residents. Wow. So, yeah, I bet it is. I mean, you can't ever uh duplicate this uh scenario you know there's no uh model so this is the this is real life and you've, you're getting like such a high dose of uh studies and different kind of protocols i mean even i i'm i'm no mount sinai but i've i myself with my sites and the monitoring we're doing with the CRO are seeing tons of covid stuff and it's just every other study we're looking at is covid i'm wondering um what are some of the challenges because you're like a, you're basically a site director, so what are some of the challenges you're doing your own Mount Sinai sponsored studies and industry sponsored studies, right? At the same time, so are you like obviously you have external CRAs coming to the site for the industry sponsored stuff, but you also have your own internal studies. Are you monitoring? You guys have your own department for monitoring this, or how is that working? So we have one investigator initiated study that we're running. It's um, single site, IND supported. Um, you know, we kind of created the database to be doing some validation checks and, and whatnot, but our manage, we have a program manager who will do some QA checks um, for the study itself. Okay. You know, we do not have any internal monitoring, sadly. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh... 
um, maybe interns, you know, we, we got to send you some CRA, CRC Academy students. You were saying that's another challenge that you've been facing now. Uh, it's so hard to find qualified um, workers, qualified employees, qualified staff, coordinators, or just anything research related. It's almost impossible to find. What, what have been your challenges with that? Like, how are you dealing with this? I had six amazing research coordinators kind of be accepted to medical school. Uh, and so they left over the summer and we had to kind of pivot and find new staff. It has definitely been challenging. There's no question about that. Um, you know, there's, there's, uh, they're the people that we find internally. I, I hired some people who were part of my network mm -hmm. and they came over to my team after the fact, um, you know, networking. I think networking is a real important factor in terms of finding the right staff. I, I can find there are tons of really smart, capable people out there. And if you're willing to put in the effort to train people, I think it's a great opportunity for them to have their eyes open to a career that could be endless. Mm -hmm. in many different ways. I, you know, but it has been hard, you know, it's when time is of the essence, it's hard to uh, properly train people, you know, we've had to pivot that as well in terms of our onboarding program. You know, I was happy that I was able to kind of move everything into, you know, a different platform and using teams and using zooms and doing an onboarding uh, process that helped give um, staff more independence, but also gave them more resources in some ways so they can understand research. Um, we needed to be able to do this in a way that was not one-on-one -on -one, hands-on, which has also been, you know, in some ways it's been great because we've produced new materials. In other ways, it's super challenging because hands-on is the best way to learn in this industry. Absolutely. We're going to have Michelle's LinkedIn profile in the show notes and under the video here, if you're watching on YouTube, I already know I can think of a few people that just finished our academies that uh, are in that area, the uh, New York, greater New York City area, and uh, I'll be sending them your way. But if you are watching and you, you know, are in that area and interested, reach out to Michelle. You know, she just said networking. So you've got her LinkedIn and you can discuss with her uh, what your capabilities are and your strengths. Now, what about... Uh, you were saying monitoring challenges. So off air, you were saying monitors are coming in every week for studies. Like, how are they keeping? Oh, up? we we're not coming. We're not letting them in. It's oh, all okay. zooms. Uh, it's remote. Okay. Um, it's all remote monitoring. We've either um, we've used we signed on with partnership with uh, Florence for eBinders, and we've. Uh, been uploading data to that as like e-source or, you know, it depends on what the monitors allow because there've been different SOPs as to what they're allowed to have access to in terms of this environment. Or we've created uh, RegCap databases and used RegCap as the source for monitoring. Um, it kind of depends on the trial, mm -hmm. but we've, we've, it's been a lot more time intensive to making sure that the monitors are doing their jobs and that we're getting, they're getting access to the data and making sure that our coordinators are giving them that proper access. Yeah. As a monitor myself, uh, I've been using RedCap when I'm monitoring and uh, I mean, it's pretty simple to use the, I can imagine it's a lot of work on the other side of it. Somebody has to scan all those things and organize them and put them into folders and what the coordinators have been telling me is that's the challenge so they really need like a month in advance notice of exactly what visits you're going to monitor and hopefully they scan everything and put it in there for you um so yeah monitoring has definitely been a challenge do you do you think that once the vaccine starts getting rolled out let's say let's fast forward to mid 2021 do you think monitors coming back to the office and, or do you think we just continue this way? I think there's going to be a hybrid situation, um, partially because we went totally electronic from a regulatory standpoint. So we could give monitors access in a remote setting to, for all the regulatory pieces. I think that that will be of help. And I think that, I think they will decrease in frequency in terms of the monitoring visits. So that's the new normal, even after this pandemic's stabilized. 
I think some of the things that we've had to pivot on will remain intact for the, for the foreseeable future for clinical research. I think mm -hmm. clinical research got um, vaulted into electronic platforms in a way that needed it in many different aspects. Yeah, yeah. I, it's funny because that's uh, what I'm hearing from the academic institutions. And then when I'm talking to the privately owned smaller sites, monitors are already coming back like pre-pandemic. I mean, they're doing on-site visits and uh, maybe it's the kind of studies we're doing. We're doing mostly CNS. So some of the patients have a harder time accessing the telehealth platform. So the monitors actually are wanting to come in on site, which is a little strange, but we're trying to keep just one monitor at a time at our offices. The monitors want to come. We told them no. <laughs> ah, so they do want to come. <laughs> they want to come. They're not They're afraid. Not afraid. Um, you know, New York has built this hexagon of states that people are allowed into in terms of travel restrictions. Oh, is that being so enforced? Is that actually being that's enforced? being enforced? So if you are from one of those states, we've allowed monitors in. Hmm. But most of our monitors are coming from all over the country. And so we've said no. Because they would stop them at, once they land and say, hey, you've got a quarantine uh, 10 days or right. something like that. Wow. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, that's, uh, that's definitely something to think about. Now, what about looking ahead? Uh, obviously, these COVID studies are going to end at some point. So what do you, have you been seeing like non-COVID stuff during this time? Like with the yes. volume? Yes. I don't know why, but I... I find, you know, when I, I was looking at metrics for 2020 and we've touched about 160 new projects this year, um, you wow. know, in some way, shape or form, you know, that doesn't mean that all of them have started or we're even participating in all of them, but our volume has increased Jeez. at least 40%, you know, but what which percentage, is, if you had to guess, what percentage of those are COVID from the 160? I only have about um, uh, probably 20 of those protocols are COVID. It's not that wow. many. Okay. Partially because all of our, you know, I would say that, uh, you know, we took a stop from COVID in June and said, we're not doing anything else. It's kind of quiet right now. Mm -hmm. And then back in September, uh, we kind of are getting back in terms of the COVID. Wow, that's uh, that's pretty interesting. So yeah, because I know a lot of the clients that we have in our site network are curious, you know, hey, are we going to see regular non-COVID studies? And I've been saying yes. I mean, we've, like you said, we've seen an increase in both, obviously COVID. And what COVID's done, and you hit on earlier, is it's created this huge this lack of supply and huge demand for researchers uh, because there's just not enough. First of all, there was not enough staff to go around even before COVID. Now you're adding all these studies. Let's say you're adding 20% more study supply and you're increasing everything else as well. So you, you're just running out of staff. And then in your case, staff was going to med school and leaving uh, Manhattan. There's been like a mini exodus, right? Is, have you been seeing people like moving out of New York or Manhattan specifically and uh, trying to live somewhere else? Yeah, people, you know, various family situations, you know, where they've had to either help with family or they decided to, they were here on visa and decided to leave and go back to their home countries. Um, you know, so major life decisions are definitely impacting my staffing, which, all, you know, all that adds to the challenges. So what's your what's your um, objectives for 2021? I guess, close out the COVID stuff and start the new stuff or? Like yeah, I think we're going to see a surge. I, uh, we've kind of have, uh, at this point, the COVID clinical trials have uh, bifurcated in New York City in terms of at our hospital. And a lot of the outpatient and a lot of the antivirals are going to the COVID research group. And then anything that's critical care is coming to my group. Um, to be managing because uh, I have pulmonary under my division. Uh, so that's kind of the dividing line for some of these. And uh, we probably are going to start a good three or four other trials, I imagine, for 21. And uh, 
for us, we are in the process of hiring our first nurse manager or PA manager to help um, help address some of the challenges that we've had in terms of uh, performing informed consents on LARs and, and orders and inpatient hospitalization studies. So that's a true pivot for us um, to be getting a nurse manager or that's a PA great. manager. So what would this person do? They'd be like a sub investigator kind of? Yeah, we would have them as a sub investigator for many of our protocols and they would be there as a resource for the clinical staff, you know, the research coordinators. Mm -hmm. And they could also serve, you know, to be helping with informed consent because that has been one of the bigger challenges is making sure that we're, you know, calling these family members who have loved ones intubated, you know, it, it's, there's a lot of clinical questions that come up. Mm -hmm. And so we have taken the stance that uh, it needs to be a clinician calling these family members. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Um, anything you want, any advice you told people to network, any advice for people wanting to break into the industry uh, right now? I mean, I think they picked a be <laughs> the best time to do it because Literally everybody's hiring. So any advice for these people that are looking to start a career in research? Use your networking skills. Use the podcasts that are available. I think there's a lot of value to the podcasts that you and your team puts out in terms of learning about clinical research. Um, you know, and, and be a technology guru also. I think, uh, you know, being open to, you know, new platforms, new systems, you know, and understanding databases and e-master trial records and e-regulatory, like learn, just be open to learning. Um, I think that that's really important. Very good advice, Michelle. I'll be sending you some potential interns and uh, I already can think of a few from the Siri Academy and I know you can use the help there. And um, let's see what happens in 2021. But hopefully by spring, summer, we get some kind of idea of uh, the landscape, the lay of the land. Uh, but it's looking like the studies are not slowing down. Um, so that's, uh, I guess that's a good thing for us in the industry because we're going to be busy. And that means we're going to be in demand. So it could be a lot worse, guys. So I think we're lucky to be in this industry when it's all said and done. And really, research has become like a household thing now. Clinical research has become a household word uh, after this pandemic. So for us in the industry, uh, it's been a long time coming, but it's here and I think that's going to continue. So I appreciate it, Michelle. Thank you very much for coming on. Uh, I know you got to go and I'll have links to Michelle's LinkedIn in the show notes and under the YouTube channel. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a good one. Stay safe.